Hi, I'm Matthias, and this is the Nagant 1895, a Belgian design, Russian issued gas seal revolver. My example here is actually single action only, but that's not exactly how it was designed nor how it remained. All that will be covered and more after we toss this in the light box. Weighing in at one and almost three quarters of a pound and with an overall length of 9.2 inches, this is a fairly light and compact revolver for its era. Even so, we managed to get an extra round having seven chambers in our cylinder, which accept single loading through a gate, the 762 by 38 millimeter rimmed gas seal cartridge. Once more, today's episode is brought to you by the letter U. Why, oh, you, you, because the vast majority of our funding comes from your direct support. If you're enjoying the show and its content, you can find us on Patreon or Player, where your contributions unlock early access to episodes and an ongoing update on how the show is being made. Additional and very welcome support also comes from what was already my favorite gun oil, Ballastol a company so obsessed with firearms preservation that they've not only provided a superior oil and backed our show, they've also introduced other products. Like, well, these guys, they're one of my favorites. Plastic picks perfect for pulling plenty of putrid pileup from the actions of your favorite collectibles, all without scratching that oh so valuable finish. If you know the value of one of these guys, you can tell I trust them. Get your own and more at ballastall.com and make sure to tell them that we sent you. If today's episode looks familiar, that's because we covered the Nagant 1895 roughly four years ago. While we tried our best at that time, I have come a long way in understanding the evolution of the modern revolver. We'll include some details on who helped out at the end of the episode. The gun we need to best understand before we dig into uh, this Nagant, however, is the Russian Smith & Wesson number no. 3. We've covered this black powder beauty before, but in review, this is a single action only top brake loading and unloading revolver, chambering an 11 mm black powder cartridge. Many militaries, the US included, considered the number three line of Smith & Wesson revolvers to be too fragile for the rigors of war. Much of this had to do with its top brake action and simultaneous eject system. While there were plenty of champions for this rapid unloading and reloading feature, including for a time Tsarist Russia, it soon fell out of favor thanks to years of extra effort in keeping the darn things running in the field. I don't want to get too deep into the Russian Smith & Wesson, as we've covered it before. However, I do want to explain some of the inherent Smith & Wesson weaknesses. I know this seems a little insane to those of you who are used to commercial arms and like having many features. The primary one on this, by the way, is the fact that we can lift this guy up, pop her open, and then that big old star extractor comes out until we make the uh, open point and snaps back down to allow for quick unloading and reloading. This is wonderful. Cavalry really appreciated it in many countries. However, it is inherently fragile because our frame in this condition is all hinged at one large but singular point. And we obviously have metal meeting metal here. We have a number of springs and levers in here in order to get this done. Uh, it all has to go down a central rod that then presses out our guy there. We can actually pop that back open. You have to have your spindle, which is then staked in the correct place. And if it gets loose, it's a nightmare. And then of course you have to be able to remove all this for cleaning. And then what you're cleaning has inherent springs in it that can rust up. You guys get the idea. There's a bunch of potential problems. And over time, smacking it open and smacking it closed, smacking it open, smacking it closed, or even just the force of firing, even under a good solid lock like this, you are eventually going to get some flex in this regard. Or if you abuse the gun, like dropping or smashing it when it's open, you're going to get even more flex. And what that does is it means you ultimately end up with some derangement. Also, something that people don't always really understand is the fact that the back of the cylinder is unsupported. Yes, this spud sort of rests in a notch in there, but it's not enough to really lock this arbor in other than at the front. So that too means that you have less reinforcement. And again, you can have some derangement to the cylinder that's going to eventually throw off accuracy or start breaking down the gun. All of these in little bits and spurts for someone that's going to shoot infrequently and take good care of their firearm, not a big deal. But when you're in an army with thousands and thousands of men carrying these things and for long hours in trials and wilderness, wherever they happen to be, when you have a statistical increase of 100% chance of malfunction, 
that doubles the amount of time you have to spend repairing these and it doubles the amount of budget you have to spend building and fitting parts. So little problems stack up bigger when you're an entire nation. Disregarding the financial aspects and all the repairs, you also have the problem of just taking care of the thing. If you get grit or mud up underneath this extractor and then it snaps over, oh, of course I didn't block it myself. If you get it under there and it snaps closed on it, well, you've increased the distance between it and the cylinder and you can't close up the action until you clear that problem. Same thing for with the other side where the hinge is at. Too much fouling or abuse in here and you no longer have your extractor. You have to pry out manually and you don't have a backup ejector rod to do so. Another problem with the Smith & Wesson is its manually rebounded hammer, which presents a little bit of a safety issue. If we cock this guy back, we can open the action. The reason for that locking tab there is not just to add extra locking strength at the moment of fire. It's to prevent you from opening it without rebounding the hammer or closing it the same. Because if we get this guy open, you can imagine a situation in which if this hammer is all the way down, there we go, as if it were actually fired and now our firing pin is protruding slightly. You can see it down in there. Well, if we close this back up with loaded rounds, successfully, mind you, uh, thankfully this tries to tell you that something's wrong, you could go around with a firearm that's essentially ready to have the hammer bap a live cartridge if this spins in the wrong position. Or if you snap it closed fast enough with the firing pin out, you may even manage to discharge the firearm while loading. So you wanna always make sure that it is rebounded, which is up to you because it does not do it for you mechanically and automatically. Looking at Smith & Wesson's big competitor in the US, this being a reproduction single action army, we can see how the solid frame solves all these problems. One, it's solid, so nothing can wear out on a hinge point. You have to stretch the entire frame. And then two, even with the hammer all the way down, you have no hope of putting a cartridge in a position during loading that's going to somehow cook off whenever you close things up. Instead, you can't even really rotate the cylinder until you rebound the hammer, not only once but twice in this design, before it frees up the cylinder to rotate. Okay, eh, I see what they're going for. Although we obviously think by the 1890s, this is long obsolete, given the repair problems they have with the Smith & Wesson and their constrained budget and their concerns about, well, money above utility, this starts to look actually appealing by comparison. Aside from its weakness as a mechanical device, the Smith & Wesson was also very large and heavy. These might have been advantages in sort of limited cavalry action, but for the average officer, it was just too much to have to lug this thing around. All this was a nuisance, but not enough to warrant a complete changeover and all the associated expenses, until Russia was forced to modernize their rifles. The 1891 adoption of the mosin nagant rifle also meant the introduction of a jacketed small-bore rifle cartridge, known as the three-line cartridge because of its 30 caliber bullet. This new ammunition provided an excuse to make some changes to the standard revolver. After the adoption of their new rifle, Russia did not disband their commission for the development of small caliber weapons. Still headed by the then Lieutenant General Nikolai Ivanovich Shagan, the commission's efforts were turned towards the matter of a handgun. This was, of course, just before the emergence of the earliest viable automatic pistols. And I'll remind you, C96 means 1896. So the best technology of the time was still the revolver. They began their search for this handgun exactly the same way as they had with their rifle. They immediately looked over to see what France was doing. At that time, they were still technically trialing their model of 1887, although at this point the work was almost done. The result would be the model of 1892, something we've covered before in quite a bit of detail. The one constant between both the 87 and 92 was the selection of a small bore jacketed projectile that absolutely matched that of their rifles. Well, at least in diameter. That's because France decided that their pistol must be able to be produced from rejected rifled barrels. This would save a ton on loss, as the problems with a rifle barrel were usually limited to one or two specific flaws or a small length of the overall. Dicing one rejected barrel up could net you a handful of potential revolver barrels that just had to be turned down and profiled correctly on the outside. Attempts were made to produce a modified Smith & Wesson in 30 caliber. But uh, because of the reduction in size and weight of the bullet, Russian ordnance found that they would have to sling it a lot faster to keep up with the desired terminal effects. This combination of small and fast, however, meant that plain lead bullets shattered. 
so they would have to jacket them. At the start, the only rules that they came up for the new revolver were that it would need to be three line in bore, that it would have to use the same rifling as the rifle, and uh, the exact nature of the cartridge was undecided, but it should be able to stop a horse. This might sound like a tall order from a 30 caliber handgun, but the intention wasn't to halt a full galloping charge dead. Rather, you should be able to shoot a horse in the leg and then cripple the animal enough that it became immediately unusable to the enemy for martial purposes. Russian agents abroad were asked to send out information and, if possible, samples of anything they might find. The first result of merit came from Henri Piper. Famed Liège gunsmith, that's in Belgium, mind you. I've heard some people tell me it's supposed to be Piper, but that sounds creepy. We've seen Piper in our show before thanks to his later work on automatic pistols, but for today's episode we're keeping further back in time and focusing on his revolver technology. In 1886 he had filed a patent on his own version of a gas seal revolving lockwork, though the concept here is that the barrel would come to meet the cylinder. Now I should say gas seal wasn't invented at that moment. By example, the Collier's revolvers often display this ability. The same concept comes up repeatedly, although with mixed levels of success, throughout years of development of different types of firearms. By example, back in 1877, French designer Francois Hennard was on the same trail, though we never hear about him. The point of a gas seal system is to eliminate one of the chief complaints about revolvers in general, that there is always a gap between the cylinder face and the back of the barrel. This permits some of the power generated by firing a cartridge to leak out of the action to the sides. That means less power for the bullet, along with some nasty hot gas that limits how you can hold the thing. In February of 1892, the Russian Commission received Henri Piper's new version of the gas seal system. This was what's known as his Model 1889 revolver, though I don't know of a patent that matches this configuration. Although that does not mean that it isn't out there. Or perhaps he ran with it until he could file a much later patent that we do know of. To the best of my knowledge, the Model of 1889 looked like this, an 8mm revolver that was fairly bulky, heavy, and complicated. However, it was gas sealed and used a swing out cylinder with simultaneous extraction. The lock work was triple action, meaning both hammer and trigger cocking. Unfortunately for Piper, the Russians weren't much interested in its nicer features. They were suspicious of double action triggers, they felt it added needless complexity, and that it encouraged wasteful expenditure of ammo, and that the extra tension required spoiled your aim. That was actually a real big part of it. Double actions were also felt to be more dangerous, as you might jerk the trigger on the draw, and frankly many soldiers did in the early days of wheel guns. Piper attempted to improve his revolver for the Russian uh, specific needs and resubmitted in May. That pistol failed testing because of poorly constructed ammunition, which resulted in poor accuracy. The commission did, however, put together a more complete list of their requirements. The new revolver must be accurate from 35 to 50 arshin. That's about 25 to 35.6 meters. At that distance, it must be able to stop a horse with one shot. Again, this is a liberal definition of stop. It must weigh no more than two pounds. It must be easy to manufacture, easy to use, and resistant to fouling or dirt. It must be of three line caliber so that it can use rejected rifle barrels. The action must be singular, no fancy double actions. Loading must also be singular, as will be ejection. No simultaneous ejection system to break. The ammunition should be rimmed for simpler manufacture, and the pistol should be zeroed for 35 arshin, unlike the further sighted Smith & Wessons. The muzzle velocity of the bullet should be about 300 meters per second. While Piper considered the matter further, competition finally reared its head. By the end of July 1892, the brothers Nagant had sent in their solution. I'm of course referring to Emile Jérôme Michel Nagant, born in 1830, and his brother, Henri Léon, three years his junior. We've discussed both of these men in greater detail in various episodes, but just as a quick review, these Belgian brothers had started their efforts in metalworking before expanding into the Liège arms trade by licensing and producing the Remington rolling block rifle. This single shot breech loader helped establish their name and build up experience in manufacture. More relevant to our show today, it was shrunk down and doubled to get their first handgun to market. The Nagant 1877 double-barreled pistol, which was fielded by the Belgian gendarmerie. While entertaining to look at, 
This was hardly the future of arms technology. So they got to work on a revolver, which they had actually patented back in 1874. This was later adopted by the Belgian army as the model 1878. This was, you'd almost consider to be a medium bore, still black powder and fairly large revolver. It was decent for its time, however the lockwork was not as simple as it could be. So the Nagants made improvements. The Belgians would adopt this in 1886, though it had actually existed some years prior. Curiously, the Belgian government also distrusted triple action mechanisms for certain roles, so they too had opted for a single action only version of Nagant's large revolver, forcing the Nagants to strip their fancy action down. This became the model of 1883, and it's a story that will apparently repeat itself. Now, at the time of the Russian trials, the most modern Nagant was the Swedish model of 1887, which was also cloned over as the Norwegian 1893. These were handier, scaled down small bore revolvers firing a 7.5 millimeter cartridge that was unfortunately rather slow in addition to being light. Not exactly what the Russians wanted, but pretty close if they could just get that muzzle velocity up. Now, to be clear, the Nagant firm had an established relationship with the Russian government, although it might go back further than you're thinking. Yes, Nagant had competed in the rifle trials, losing out slowly to Mosin's ever-evolving design, though there is strong argument that the magazine was largely Nagant's creation, something we addressed in our episode on that particular rifle. Fun fact, though, Nagant had actually been sending samples to Russia since at least 1874, apparently showing a version of the Greek Milonis rifle to the Russian Navy. In 1876, they were actually contracted to produce 500 revolvers for the Russian government, though those were of the Galand patent. And before you think it, no, the Galand did not inspire the model of 1878, as that was patented back in 1874. Coming up to our trials in 1892, what did Nagant send over? Well, of course, it was a gas seal revolver that would ultimately morph into the thing we have here today. We already know the ending. But what's curious is how we got there. Many people believe Nagant simply designed his own gas seal in response to Piper and the Russian demand. While that's fairly true in some ways, it ignores one thing. Nagant designed his own gas seal long before Piper did. This patent was filed back in 1877, and although it is not our revolver today at all, there is a certain family resemblance. This system used a, well, a rolling sort of breech block with another rolling sort of locking bar behind it. If we ignore the revolver lockwork for just a second, which is fairly complex and doesn't come back today, the actual gas seal system for indexing the cylinder forward really resembles a rolling block. Just like Piper's later patent, the case here is obturating in the chamber, so that the Nagant was not a copy of the Piper concept. The core lockwork of a revolver today can be seen in this patent from Nagant in 1880, sorta. Of. The single action use of a hammer extension, meaning a trigger extension, has been kept. If we look at the center, there's a depiction of a hammer nose for double action, though they also included an Adams-style push bar version as well. That's because this patent focuses more on the combination hammer and rebound block, which showed up in our 1887 Swedish revolvers. Frankly, much of our revolver today is found in that episode. The lockwork and general construction are all the same, as is the ejector and the loading gate. However, Nagant made significant additions in order to impress the Russians. The biggest of which was their 1892 patented gas seal system. Here, the cylinder again moves forward as the hammer is cocked. This is accomplished by pressure from the hand and a supporting tilting breech block, not unlike the original 1877 patent, though now it's supported by a vertically sliding block, which we'll see better later, along with how the cylinder is indexed forward. The return method at this time seems to be by using the cylinder stop and its matching slots in the cylinder wall. The cylinder and gate now also interact. Thanks to the constant tension rearward on the cylinder, notches have been set at the cylinder's rear facing edge, which meet a stud on the front of the gate. These will detent into each of the loading positions. At this point, the firing pin is fixed solidly to the hammer. It's also worth noting that this is still a triple action depicted in the patent, though the Russians were interested in single action only. Adapted for the Russian three-line diameter, the Nagant could fit seven rounds instead of the usual six. 
its 115 millimeter barrel could get the bullets moving just over 300 meters a second, about 985 feet per second. Just for comparison, that unsealed 7.5 Swedish action with its own cartridge, uh, by the way, that cartridge was a slightly changed clone of the Swiss 7.5 revolver cartridge, the same that inspired the French 1892. It's all one big family. The 7.5 Swedish unsealed was moving at about 725 feet per second. So the Nagant's 985 feet per second was a gain of over 35%. Though these cartridges aren't exactly equal to start, the Russians did ultimately select the same bullet weight, so it's a fair comparison. The improved cartridges at a distance of 35 arshin were able to pass through three one-inch boards. Half on average would actually clear five boards. That's two more than the best of the old Smith & Wesson 11 mm Even at 200 arshin, they would still clear one board. The Nagant was also compact and light and far more convenient than the Smith & Wesson, though they felt it still could be lighter, and there was some sign of cylinder jamming, likely on the release of the trigger. There were also issues with the firing pin, light strikes, and binding. 25 examples were ordered for testing. At the same time, the Nagant brothers were asked for their price to release the patent for Russian production. Their answer upset the Russians greatly. 75,000 rubles. The Russian government said nope, no thank you, and cancelled the order for the 25 trials models. In November of 1892, the Russian artillery directorate publicly announced a competition, though it seems to have been a sort of quiet announcement. They updated the list of requirements, which were very similar to before. The only real changes were the addition of requiring the revolver to work with both black powder and smokeless powder, that it should withstand 1,500 atmospheres of pressure, use a center fire cartridge, and specifically a 108 grain bullet with a copper nickel silver jacket. They also announced a prize, 20,000 rubles for the best revolver and 5,000 for the best cartridge. However, the winner also forfeited his rights in regards to Russian manufacture, both at home and abroad. That last bit was probably a lesson learned from the rifle, which saw some arguing over production in France by the Nagants. The inventor, of course, retained the right to produce for other nations and the private market. Despite this drop in price, both Henri Piper and the brothers Nagant would return with improved revolvers. Piper's attempt is a bit hard to pin down. It was now a gate loader and apparently no longer indexed uh, the cylinder forward for gas seal. Instead, it simply rammed the individual cartridge through the cylinder. I would love to see one. This system required a shorter cylinder and therefore weaker cartridges. He sent it in both single and triple action. The latter was immediately rejected. The former received some experimentation, but was ultimately found to be too weak. In December, he tried again. The revolver then likely looked like this, though I'm unsure if it had the magazine attached. Much of this design came from Argentine artillery captain Antonio Garcia Reynoso. This revolver is designed to feed from the magazine into the cylinder. On the right side, there is also an auto ejector, which tosses spent cases out as you fire. Unfortunately, the design was too complicated, too delicate, and the uh, uncovered ejection port worked a lot like what we saw with the Swiss 1878 episode that we covered. It worried the Russians that ammo would just fall free, which was technically possible, especially when operated slowly, as you would with a, I don't know, single action only? The ejecting cases also flew at the shooter, an unwelcome distraction. The Nagants, however, made simple, effective changes to their 1892 example. They enlarged the rear sight notch and added a stepped front sight, which was better at preventing glare. They improved the contours for loading, enlarged the cylinder ever so slightly, but also fluted it to get a net loss in weight. The grip was shortened up and its angle altered to make it more comfortable. The ejector was shortened and, in time, the firing pin became hinged. The improved examples went up against domestic competition in Russia. Sergei Mosin reappeared, but with an awful multi-barreled design that weighed far too much. Modified Smith & Wessons were also submitted by the heads of the Tula and Sestores arms plants. Neither were particularly outstanding. Proper testing of the Nagant was therefore carried out in March of 1894, with examples being sampled out to the cavalry and artillery officers' schools in St. Petersburg, plus a cartridge commission which was running sort of independently. 
The control was of course the Smith & Wesson number no. 3. Overall, everyone agreed that the Nagant was lighter, handier, and they noted that it was flatter shooting with better penetration and testing. The cavalry school generally appreciated its potential for combat service, however, they weren't too happy about it being single action only, and they hated the lack of simultaneous extraction. Singular gate loading wasn't great either, especially on horseback. This was seen as a major setback from the Smith & Wesson. The artillery school should have fared better, but their examples were apparently poorly constructed or suffered some sort of flaw because they found it all but inoperable and entirely inaccurate. All right, so that went poorly, but abandoning the Nagant now would leave them starting from scratch. So let's just meet these guys in the middle. The commission asked Nagant to provide a triple action version of the same revolver. This was a concession to one of the cavalry concerns. The lesser concern? This was accomplished rapidly, of course, because it was designed to be a triple action to begin with. And the piece was tested in April. The results of firing for accuracy with double action pull were so bad that the commission felt fully justified in its previous decision to remain single action only, thus addressing nothing. This should all feel really familiar if you watched our Mosin episode. The Russian government at the time had this nasty habit of deciding one thing at a time, putting it forward, and if it received complaints, not even really addressing or just reproving their point, locking it in, and then doing the next one thing. Only one variable can change at a time on the firearm, and therefore you get these perverse stacks of features that don't always make sense. By example, this is quite frankly the opposite of what John Moses Browning would do, which is a holistic method of having all the parts playing together at once. Look at it from where the Nagants are. They're told, hey, you don't have to worry about how bad the double action pull would be on this gas seal thing because we're only doing single action. Oh wait, we do want to do double action, so give us a sample of that. Oh wow, this double action's so awful to pull, it's a good thing we don't want any double actions, ever. Even so, after further refinements, their final considerations were made in the spring of 1895. Slow loading isn't a problem, but we do need to offer a triple action, but we'll only grant it to officers. It's important to remember, Russia was still a stratified country. Officers weren't just educated common people, they were mostly part of an aristocratic class. The buglers and NCOs weren't expected to handle drawing a double action pistol without shooting themselves in the leg. Let alone the same old concerns about wasting ammo or negligently discharging into the back of an officer. And they also really worried about having to waste a ton of time training people to use the double action accurately. The fact that the revolver could easily be swapped from single to triple action and back with minimal parts changes made the decision to adopt both a triple and single action a lot easier, as there would be few problems with field repairs or variations in production. Only a few late problems were tidied up now. You see the guns were apparently jamming up, uh, the bullets were jumping forward due to the shock of their companions being fired off. Uh, this was resolved by setting them a little bit deeper and making them a little flat-faced and sadly reduced the muzzle velocity slightly. Even so, a crimp had to be added to help further. The end result looked like this. A bullet set way down in the case, now moving at about 935 feet per second, a reduction of 50 from the initial test samples. This is still slower than 9mm Parabellum, by the way, despite being smaller and lighter. The last change that I know of was an increase in the rebate at the front of the cylinder. I've read this was to prevent fouling from tying up the action, but I'm not really sure how that affected it. It might have actually been to assist unloading, but I'll explain that in a little bit. With all that settled, the Nagant was declared the winner. The adoption was approved by Emperor Nicholas II on May 13, 1895. The Minister of War uh, processed it in June. The brothers Nagant received 25,000 rubles for both the revolver and its cartridge, following which they finally patented the single action arrangement for their lockwork in Belgium. This also covered a unique Sprague mechanism to prevent counter rotation. So what exactly had Russia bought? Well, let's actually start with the revolver as it was designed, a triple action, three line officer style revolver. All right, I have the Russian Nagant 1895, and just for comparison, it's closest cousin that we have available here. We have a Norwegian Nagant. Now this is just like the Swedish 87, with the upgrade to the front sight, which actually seems to have come across for the most part, although 
on the Russian style, we do have a dovetailed sight, at least at this moment we do. There'll be some changes in these over the years. Now, other than our notched half moon, what have we got going on? Well, overall, very similar looking. I mean, really similar. You, you can tell they came out of the same shop until you start looking a little closer. Yes, stylistic things like uh, a round barrel instead of this uh, octagonal, but also if we look at the grips very specifically, there's a significant difference in length. And in Russian production, there's gonna be some differences in the construction of how this uh, whole bottom piece dovetails together. We'll see that more in a moment. Just like its precursor, this guy is a triple action. So we can either single action, cock that hammer back, pull the trigger and have that hammer fall, or I can pull all the way through, albeit heavily, and that's our double action. If you might have noticed, every time I did that, the uh, cylinder indexes forward, that is our gas seal system. It uses a very specific cartridge that then meets inside of the uh, rear of the barrel or the forcing cone, and then it obturates on firing, meaning that it fills up that space, and there's no gas lost in this gap in front of the cylinder. As a matter of fact, without live rounds in here, that cylinder's not even all the way forward. It would actually be just a bit further forward like that if the rim of a cartridge was in there to help with uh, how the mechanism works. And I'll show you that in some detail in just a moment. Uh, it is a gate loader. So if I flip her over, we just flip this guy open. It's biased into its two positions by this large flat spring on the outside. And then we can rotate our cylinder in order to feed our rounds. You may notice there's a little bit of click clunk sound. Click clunk. The clunks are actually a detent position that lets you line up and even backspin a little bit to get the perfect feed or ejection point. And talking about ejection, if I roll this rod, I can pull her out, flip her over, and we can pull our spent case, or rather eject our spent casings. This is a parent system, being that it's wrapped around the barrel, and then tucks away inside the central arbor before we rotate it to locking in position. All that is handled by this spring here, which puts bias on the rod. Now the ejector is also part of our takedown system. If we rotate it all the way out of our way, it's still blocking the arbor thanks to that little cleat. If we have it folded up, yeah, it's blocking the arbor. But in between, if you line it up just right, is a position in which you can go ahead and remove that guy, which with the gate open, allows us to pop out the cylinder. Comparing the earlier style of cylinder with the later is more interesting than you might realize. Yes, it's seven shots instead of six. Yes, it's larger, both in its uh, diameter and it's a little bit longer in length, but there are actually a number of technological advances that have been integrated into this design in a short period of time. At the back, you might notice that the ratchet teeth have become more complicated. That's because of the hands added support in indexing this cylinder forward and back for gas seal. Also, there's all these notches at the back. Remember I said it detented into various positions? Well, that's because these interact with, well, actually the loading this little stud right here, which turns into that particular path on the cylinder when the gate is open. This stud will meet with one of those seven notches, getting the clunk from our click clunk and allowing you to find your indexing position easier. At the front of the cylinder, we see more differences. Very beautifully, all seven chambers have been recessed somewhat so that this will overlap the back of the barrel slightly help with obturation. I've been told the depth of this was increased in order to make the gun operate more reliably with fouling, although I'm not really sure what they were running into to cause that problem, given that it was supposed to seal to begin with. Also, it's less obvious if you haven't actually handled one of these in some way, that there's a major difference right here with the, uh, well, I guess you call this sort of the extension off of the face of the cylinder that allows it to fill up all the way for the full length of the arbor and yet leave a little bit of a gap so that it's free to rotate and not drag up against the back of the barrel. This little extension is actually spring-loaded in the 1895. Uh, if that's not so obvious, well, look at that. The other one? Nah, this is set firm. Now, what that spring's doing is when we index this forward, it's compressing, and then as we release, it springs this guy back to the rear where he belongs. So, if you're ever trying to put your cylinder back in a Nagant revolver, and you find it just doesn't want to go, especially in 1895, I should say, then you might just have to press on that guy so that it'll drop on in. And with the cylinder back in place, we can check out another change coming over from the Norwegian. Yes, we have our regular cylinder stops, but there's also these additional flats 
to the rear of each stop. Now, currently they're doing nothing because the gate is open. But if we close it, we can actually find out that this is a sprag system. Uh, let me get a better look at this. Note the extension at the top of the gate. It's not just a thumb pad for you to operate, which is handy, that's nice and big, but that length also keeps it in contact with these notches, seven of them, all around the cylinder. They act as a sort of ratchet, and it needs to be so long because the cylinder goes forward and back, so it still reaches, and then when we pull the trigger, it comes back, it's still in contact. Now, what that's doing is, it's preventing the cylinder from counter-rotating. It can't go back the way it came. If I open the gate up, you'll see I can actually rotate a little bit further back before I hit the hand. If the hand were not in play, we could really just rotate this all the way around the wrong way. And there is a time when using this revolver where the hand isn't in play. It's when you release the trigger. Then the hand goes skipping down the back of the ratchet teeth again. And if you had, let's say, three or four empty rounds here and several loaded rounds on the other side, because it's rotating that way, you could be in a position where this wants to rotate one click back and then you'd fire nothing when you pulled the trigger again. In order to avoid that, the gate prevents it from happening. We can see this a little bit better from the rear. Watch the gate as I work the action. It pivots out slightly and then it pops in. That's when it's locked into the next ratchet tooth. Out, in. And that is how she goes. Very similar to the Colt 1878, actually. I should also point out that period documents say that the ejector rod is not always necessary. It should only be used if you have a stuck case. Because of the unique cartridge that this gun uses, the case mouth is always at the very end of the cylinder after firing. And so you can often just index it over, pop it with your finger, and gravity will do the rest. However, in experience, many got stuck anyway, and so you'd have to pull the rod. And once you do that, you've wasted a lot of time, and you're having two different methods of unloading. Field stripping your Nagant starts here, with this screw on the side of the receiver. Now you could or could not have removed the cylinder, we've already shown you how to do that. But, if we loosen the screw up and then give it a little shove, it starts to push off the side plate that unfortunately is hiding from your view the way I'm doing this, but I'll show it to you in just a moment. Alright, side plate comes off, it's got our center wood grip section, our left side wood grip section, and a hunk of metal. And in here we have our beautiful lock work. Single action is accomplished just how you'd expect, so I cock that guy back. We got our two extensions kissing here, like we've seen in so many other revolvers. When I pull that, she falls. We also have a hammer nose, which compresses as I come back by, and pops into position for that trigger extension to go ahead and serve as our double action function. Once she slips by, it comes crashing down. Now the hammer is an auto rebounding type, so if I hold that trigger back and I push the hammer forward, that's actually where it would strike the firing pin, or where the firing pin would strike the primer. And then if I release it, you can tell it has a little bit of bias. That's created by a second little arm off the top of the mainspring, some complicated geometry, uh, laying it on a shelf on the other side of the hammer, wants it to bias back. So when she falls, inertia carries her into the boop, and then she goes on and pops on back. Now, this is not a positive hammer block, obviously. That is accomplished by this vertical block here. We're gonna talk more about him in a moment, but when that block is down, the hammer can no longer go anywhere for sure. Very drop safe. The lower part of the main spring is powering the trigger, like you'd expect. It also travels inside the trigger slightly to bias the hand. So it sits on a sort of half moon notch in the pin that is the hand's connection to the trigger and keeps it moving over center into the cylinder where we need it to constantly press anyway. Whew. That is a fairly standard revolver lockwork, although I will say this little bias extension is a new thing that we haven't seen before. Um, and the way it implements what is sort of a comm blade, instead of having the wraparound comm blade arm, we've actually just gone on through tunneling in the trigger, but roughly similar to what we've seen before. Now, if we want to talk about the gas seal operation of this gun, it gets a little harder to see unless I start taking extra pieces out. So let's do a little bit of that. With the hammer and mainspring out of the way, we can see a little bit more what's going on in here. We have an, another extension or a further extension of the trigger that's actually lower down in here behind what would have been the hammer. And it's working on a vertical block. This is actually a locking block just like you'd see on say a Winchester rifle. And what it does is it rises, tips and supports a rotating breech block, which we can barely see the bottom of here. When that happens, the breech block and hand are gonna push the cylinder forward and that's going to seal up our system, compressing that spring at the front. So let me give it a try. It's gonna be a little difficult without the spring tension supporting the hand, but we're up. And then after we're up, we're right up against that breech block. And if we keep going, 
it shoves the breech block forward and seals up our system. Now it's not perfect right now because we don't have any cartridges in here. The breech block would support the back of the cartridge. There's some thickness in the rim, so you'd actually be further forward like this, but that would be a complete gas seal. Your cartridge is supported, the one that's being fired. It goes boom. Uh, it doesn't matter that this gap is here in that case at the rear and everything works accordingly. One downside of this though, is the other six cartridges are not supported. They have a little bit of play, the distance that we just indexed the cylinder. And in doing so, it creates a bit of an inertial hammer and it would send their bullets slowly loosening forward out the front of the case until they got lost or jammed up in the action. Hence the need for a very deep crimp on the Nagant ammo. But outside of those little problems, this is a pretty good way of getting a gas seal on a revolver. Now I know what you're thinking. You can't see a lot of what's going on in there. Let me show you it a little bit closer. Although first, watch the arm. Let's reset that trigger. The spring would have done that for us, but it's going to lower down until, yep, spring tension returned everything, and then it's gonna yank that block all the way back down. Here, let me pull it apart some more. All right, we have our breech block, we have our locking block, and we have our hammer. And there's a number of ways that these interact that are fairly ingenious, not just what you're thinking off the bat. So if we look at the breech block, and the locking block. They're normally arranged like this until this rises up into position, and you can clearly see how that would shove it forward, although I'm obviously shoving the locking block back because this is resting on the table. That interaction is then cuddled by the hammer, and at the moment of fire, you would have something, and I'm sorry, the levels aren't really working because this lower section is behind the hammer, so I'd have to kind of lift that up for you to see it. Let me get that, there we go. This is what our moment of fire looks like. Now. You can tell a couple things at once. Number one, the locking block is also serving as a hammer block. So when the system lowers this back down and the hammer is returned to the rear, let me get this guy out of the way for a second, just so you can see it. When this comes back down and the hammer is back, it can't fall. Remember I said it was locked? It can't fall because of the locking block. So it's working both ways. It's not just pushing on this side against the breech block, it's also pushing on this side against the hammer, acting as a very positive drop safety. That's good design. When it comes up, it meets that notch in the hammer, and therefore the hammer can fall and reach the uh, primer. Now to do that, it has to go all the way through the breech block, which would have been roughly in this position, a bit hard to emulate, but there we go. And as you can tell, that's a great big distance for a firing pin to go, which is why this has such an awkwardly, awkwardly long one. Uh, let me go ahead and pull that guy back out. Yeah, look how long that is. Now, originally this was fixed, and of course they broke because good luck getting that angle just right every time when manufacturing. So it was fit, fitted to a pin and it's got a little tilt to it so that it can find its way where it needs to go in order to discharge our cartridge. Now, this I cannot underestimate as being a very brilliantly designed system that allows for a lot of shared components of very specific shapes doing everything that they need to do. Now, of course, it's a lot easier to see inside of this revolver with the help of Bruno's X-ray vision. Despite being simple to use on the surface, the Russian Nagant hides a number of complex mechanisms. To load up, we'll open the gate. It has a small tooth near its hinge point, which presses the cylinder slightly forward when opened. The tooth also engages one of seven matching notches in the cylinder, so that as we rotate it manually, there is a slight detent to align each chamber properly. Much of the lock work is powered by this single large V-spring, the upper half of which is shaped to match a small nubbin on the back side of the hammer. At rest, this spring pressure actually biases the hammer into a slightly rebounded position. When the hammer is cocked back, it compresses the mainspring. An extension off the bottom front of the hammer engages the long rear extension from the trigger. This causes the trigger to be dragged along when we cock the hammer, and eventually the two extensions kiss. Pulling the now very light trigger releases the extensions from each other, causing the hammer to fall. Inertia carries it over center, discharging a cartridge before being rebounded by the mainspring. This is the hammer nose, a lever off the breast of the hammer powered by its own spring. If we pull the trigger for double action operation, the trigger extension collides with the nose, tipping the hammer back until the extension clears and the hammer comes crashing down. You might have noticed that the trigger is a fairly complex shape. This allows it to serve as the heart of the various processes that must occur all at once for this revolver to work properly. First, let's look at the hand, which is affixed to a hole in the trigger. As we pull the trigger, the hand rises and presses into the cylinder. This rotates the cylinder one seventh of a turn, indexing the cartridge into place. The cylinder stop, an extension off the trigger, halts the cylinder in the correct alignment, preventing over-rotation. 
The hand is constantly biased towards the cylinder by the lower mainspring arm thanks to a half moon cut on its axis pin. Looking at our trigger once more, we can see an additional flat extension that travels behind the hammer. This interacts with the lower extension of what is effectively a locking block. This piece travels vertically in a groove, rising when we pull the trigger and being tugged down when we release. The block both drives and locks this component here, essentially a pivoting bolt. This both moves the cylinder forward for a gas seal and provides support to the rear of the cartridge. The bolt in turn is supported by the locking block, making the whole moving system rigid when fired, but able to retract when released. This is done so that the cartridge case mouth is fully seated inside the forcing cone at the rear of the barrel, a gas seal system that prevents loss of energy. The cylinder is constantly biased rearward by an inset coil spring. As we pull the trigger, the hand again turns the cylinder. Pressure then drives the cylinder forward, sealing the action before firing. Releasing the trigger releases the pressure, so the cylinder springs back into position. While we're discussing the cylinder, let's look at another job the gate accomplishes. This blade-like extension engages each of the seven notches on the outside rim of the cylinder. These act as an opposing ratchet. While the hand is being reset, the gate tooth prevents counter-rotation of the cylinder, guaranteeing we don't fire the same cartridge twice. Ejection is of the parent type, with a rod stowed inside the arbor, which can be rotated, then pulled clear, at which point the whole assembly can be rotated around the barrel, aligning the rod with the first chamber. From here, we just manually strike out each case and rotate the cylinder to the next. Now let's go shoot this perfectly simple piece. That is one of the firearms of all time. I can understand why the commission wasn't big on double action now. What about the other version of the 1895 though? The three line soldier style revolver? Well, I happen to have one right here, so let's get a look at the differences. From the outside, it's very difficult to tell a single action only Nagant 1895 from a triple action Nagant 1895. However, there is one way that you could probably spot it. No, uh, it's not going to be some front sight difference as those changed multiple times in production. It's not necessarily going to be in the lanyard or anything like that. There shouldn't be any marking differences either because both were produced in the same years all along the way until, well, until we get past World War I at least. Now, on this side, again, no real clues from the rested position, which I understand is going to frustrate some of you who rely on, say, pictures online to understand what you're seeing. Let me show you the real secret. If we cock back the hammer, there is our little towel. This cliff right there. And if you're able to look down the action, 
there's a notch right there on the locking block. You can kind of barely make it out, but in person, it's pretty obvious. Now, before I show you all these parts compared to the triple action version, let me get a look at how this works. Loading and ejecting, everything's the same. We just can't pull the trigger in order to make this go bang. If we do, it kind of turns the cylinder and then stops. I mean, a hard dead lock with some flex in it. That's because this was a triple action lock work that was adapted to be single action only. And in doing so, they had to make one big fix, which is that just deleting the nose isn't enough. You could in theory have just kept pulling the trigger and indexing the cylinder and just not working the hammer. And then you get out of index and it's a whole mess and it just confuses everybody as to how the gun works or not. So you had to make sure that as you pulled the trigger, it did lock up, it presented a dead trigger. In order to do that, they put a hook on the hammer, as you saw before, and a hook on the locking block that interact. Let me show you that in better detail. As you can see, we have no hammer nose. Uh, there is no double action. If I try to raise it, uh, yeah, there's nothing for it to catch on to. Single action works the same though. Extension off the trigger meets an extension off the hammer. And when we pull the trigger, it drops. The entire uh, gas seal system, everything else is the same. The core difference, right there. It's a bit hard to make out, but you can see there's a notch on the locking, the rising locking block, and a notch on the hammer. If I start to pull the trigger, they collide. And when they do, the hammer does not come back, the trigger halts, and therefore we know we're dealing with a single action only revolver. We can see it all here in our animation. The same lock work, except for the lack of a hammer nose. And of course, the addition of a tooth on the locking block to keep the hammer from being able to come on back when we pull the trigger. So let's just get it over to May to shoot it. Certainly functional. All right, the revolvers have been selected, but how were they produced? In January of 1896, 20,000 revolvers were ordered from Fabrique d'Armes, MLA et Léon Nogon, along with 500,000 cartridges. 
The cost per revolver was 30 rubles, though some sources claim only 27. That's fairly expensive, mind you, as the French 1892 worked out to about 15 rubles. Later domestic production of the revolver would get it down to about 1785 for a single action, mind you, a bit more for a double. So still fairly expensive by comparison. I'm uncertain how many Liège revolvers were manufactured in single versus double action. Some sources happily claim that they were all single action. Others say that they were all triple action, but included instructions for conversion to single action, which the, which the Russians did. I, I don't see any proof of that. Given what I know, it's likely that the vast majority started off as single action only. Perhaps some of the government order was also triple action with the intention to sell to officers through the government. The Nagant firm also directly advertised their triple actions to officers, selling for just 25 rubles, that's less than the government contract. That might be because the same contract stipulated that the Nagant firm had to provide tooling and material assistance to the Tula arsenal to establish domestic manufacture. This process was supposed to happen quickly as they wanted to hit 180,000 revolvers in just a few short years. However, the Russian treasury wasn't so robust and they struggled to overhaul the arsenal in time. While that was going on, Emile Nagal retired. He had suffered from progressive blindness for a few years now. So in 1896, he left the business, which now reformed as Fabrique d'Armes Léon Nagal. I've heard stories that Léon had done most of the development of the 1895. However, I have my doubts, as there doesn't seem to have been much innovation from the firm in terms of arms technology after Emile left. Deliveries to Russia must have begun after his departure, only Leon's name appears on the commercial markings. All examples I know of are dated from 1896 to 1898, though the majority are from the later date. Tulip for domestic production carried on slowly. The control samples were uh, received in July of 1897, and in October, government orders included the expectation of one quarter of the first 20,000 domestic units would be triple action officers use. These were to be sold directly from the factory to the officers and paid for out of their own wallets. Production was begun during 1898, although only a handful emerged as part of setting up machinery and establishing final tolerances. Mass production began in 1899. The markings read Imperial Tula Arms Factory along with the date. Fair warning, just because you might find one marked 1898 out there, that doesn't mean it was actually assembled in that same year as many parts were made well ahead of time. Cartridges were produced at the Tula cartridge plant, no surprise there. Russian production revolvers were nearly identical to the Belgian, however they did change just a couple things. The front sight was altered to a simple half moon. This was done to prevent snagging and tearing of the holsters on the draw. The butt cap on Belgian production was split in half using a tooth section for the lanyard. The Russians saved time by having a solid base and a step side panel. You might notice that the lanyard ring set screw has been replaced with a simple pin, which also acted as a locating stud for the side plate. Checkering was reduced and made more coarse, and the escutcheons were left round. Production ramped up in 1900, though it was still limited by a strained budget. This meant that there were just enough Nagants on hand to have them appear in action in China during the Boxer Rebellion. Supposedly, one was wielded by Lieutenant Stankovic of the 12th Siberian Regiment during the capture of the Chinese fortress of Taku. He apparently used it while breaching a room, taking out two Chinese soldiers who rushed at him. Okay, good start. Still, the global economy got worse in this period, so uh, the 1901 panic stretched into a multi-year recession. Once production hit the initial target of 180,000, it dwindled in 1902 and 1903, despite a need for some more handguns. At the time, the Nagant was earning something of a mixed reputation, though. Throughout the early 1900s, we see officers' reports and opinions arguing the merits of the new little revolver. On the whole, however, cavalry absolutely hated these things. Reloading the Nagant on horseback was a nightmare. At just a trot, it took 56 seconds, and even at a walk, 44. There was growing pressure to investigate the emerging semi-automatic pistols, which had distinct advantages. There was, however, very little money to deal with the issue, especially since the factory just got set up to the tune of 5 million rubles. The matter was tabled. Uh, they weren't even making many of the revolvers as it was at the moment. In 1904, only 3,922 were allocated. Thankfully for the Nagant revolver, the Japanese intervened in this slow downgrade. The Russo-Japanese War naturally created a sudden demand for more small arms. 
the Nagant included. However, the whole thing proved to be disastrous for the Russians, who were summarily defeated and then surprisingly poured everything into dragging it out further, nearly collapsing the country and practically bankrupting it. Production of Nagant shot back up in 1905, of course, uh, over 60,000 units, but the performance in the field was a mixed bag. The heavy double action and slow loading were, of course, hated. But the firearm itself was rugged and reliable. Its Japanese counterpart was a double action only top break of limited power. Still to me a better choice. Though Japanese Mark Nagants do turn up from time to time, clearly taken in the war. Neither revolver was particularly useful in the fairly long ranged fight. Instead, both sides realized that as far as small arms were concerned, the machine gun had emerged triumphant. Both armies would take it much more seriously going forward. Handguns had been found wanting on the whole, they were too short range for the open field, and in tight quarters they were too slow on the draw to deal with what was a very surprising ambush. Not totally the Nagant's fault that it didn't do a great job, right? But still, the complaints kept piling up. Ordnance conservatives tried to explain the issues away, relying on convoluted tests. One such regularly cited was a determined attacker drill, with a target rigged to approach at a running speed from various short distances. Known trialed pistols include the Webley Fosbury, Luger 1900, and a Browning pistol. I'm not sure if it was a 1900 or 1903, or maybe both. Each time, a firearm was tested by dumping the magazine and then attempting to reload before the target could reach you. Only the Luger 1900 beat the clock, managing to be reloaded and discharged with two extra rounds, though this was only in 30% of overall attempts. The fact that the Nagant was dead last didn't factor into it, because only a complete reload and fire counted. Everything else they tested couldn't keep up. Even so, in 1907, both the Luger and the FN 1903 automatic were approved for private purchase by officers of the Russian army. This of course introduced an issue with ammunition and parts, but the answer was, if your gun breaks, you always can take a Nagant. Regardless of what anyone wanted, the budget was still straining. By 1908, the matter was severe. Tula had all but halted production. Keeping a state factory in running order is difficult. If you stop all work, you have to let people go, and once they're gone, that talent is hard to get back. Especially if you find yourself in another crisis later on. So that same year, it was decided to allow Tula to sell Nagants directly to various military and other state units instead of just to the army. This flipped the relationship between the production of single and triple actions for a time. Turns out no one else was interested in a single action only. This did not, however, change the army's opinion. In 1911, fears of war uh, brought more production. The army and various armed forces branches all sought out the only handgun available, the Nagat. Which, by the way, had new markings starting in 1912. Now reading Tula, Emperor Peter the Great, Arms Factory. And the date, of course. This was in honor of the bicentennial of the factory being founded in 1712. Now, of course, the Balkans erupted into conflict and Russia paid close attention. They also correctly predicted the all but inevitable European war. By January of 1914, some 574,426 Nagant had been produced. The estimated breakdown was roughly 23% triple action and 77% single. By July of 1914, 424,434 were in army control. The rest had either been sold to other departments or lost in combat and other wear and tear. This was an impressive number, but at the time it was estimated that some 436,210 were needed for mobilization. The balance was made up with the Old Smith & Wesson. This was not seen as a major disaster, as Tula could catch up within half a year. Trouble is, once the fighting actually began, that expectation went out the window. The Great War quickly exploded into a scale that few had anticipated. Total war meant huge armies who needed firearms. And even if you could equip them all, the rate of death and destruction was severe, so manufacturer had to go all out just to meet replacement numbers. We've spoken many times about Russia's shortages during the war, especially as pertains to rifles. The Mosin was supplemented with anything that they could get in numbers and provide some level of stable ammunition supply, as well as contracting for more in the US. While they also snatched up a variety of pistols, including contracting for the model of 1911, the Nagant remained much more of a standard than even the Mosin. That's likely thanks to having nearly enough on hand for the first push of the war and the correct decision to spin up production 
rapidly. Another 25,000 were ordered by September of 1914. In June of 1915, emergency measures were approved, requisitioning equipment and supplies from private industry. Much of this made its way to Tula, and some of that was put to use making more revolvers. As a snapshot, for the year 1915, 57,501 triple action officers revolvers were produced. However, they were beat out by 62,641 single action soldiers models. So the single action only was still preferred. Total production from 1914 to 1917 is estimated at 474,800 pieces. To accomplish this, the workday was increased to 12 hours. Workers received only three days off a month and the strict inspection standards were somewhat loosened. When necessary, some machine operations were performed by hand so long as it would add more revolvers by the end of the day. These were, of course, issued to officers, NCOs, signal troops, cavalry, horse and foot artillery, and to machine gun teams. The emergence of closer ranged combat also created opportunities to replace rifles and carbines with more available handguns for shock troops and grenadiers. Of course, during 1917, Russia underwent some political change. The October Revolution marked its departure from the Great War and began years of internal civil war. Right away, the Bolsheviks held the Tula Arms Factory. Production carried on through 1918, but was limited by various shortages and interruptions, including being converted to the metric system. Initially, Tsarist markings were just polished off existing Nagant revolvers, if they were even modified at all. But in 1919, the Arsenal mark was changed. It now read rather plainly, Tula Arms Factory. Frankly, it seems like they ground off the Emperor Peter the Great part from the marking die. This didn't last long, however, because in 1921, it changed again. Up top, the initials for the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic, followed by an abbreviated first Tula Arms Factory. Following the creation of the USSR, the marking would change again in 1924. Now, USSR, first arms factory, Tula. That same year, the Nagant revolver was approved as an honorary revolutionary weapon. This was, at the time, the highest award in the Soviet armed forces for senior commanders for combat achievements. Not really a commander, but he deserves it. Now, with the Civil War over, the new government could finally sit down and consolidate its arms. Reviewing everything available, they took measures to standardize as much as possible, and in doing so, the single action only Nagant, well, that was abandoned. Only the triple actions would remain in service. Oh, fancy. I'm unsure if they had even made single actions since 1918. In 1929, the markings changed again. The text was replaced with a simple logo, a five-pointed star with an arrow inset. This marking would remain with minor changes to the fletching of the arrow for the rest of production at Tula. During the 1930s, it became apparent that the Nagant revolver was obsolete. That might have been apparent the day it was adopted. Everyone else was transitioning to automatics, and while there were revolver holdouts, they basically broke into one of two camps those that couldn't afford the changeover and those who had purposely stayed with a revolver for some strange reason, though they tended to have rapid ejection designs and not gate loaders. The government would investigate their own automatic pistol. This eventually resulted in the Tokarev, which was refined into the TT-33. In 1934, there would be no additional orders for the Nagant revolver. Not that none were assembled, mind you, just that there would be no more ordered beyond those from the previous year. However, the Tokarev pistol suffered some teething issues, which meant that it couldn't be spun up to fully replace the revolvers right away. The Nagant, therefore, returned to reduced but otherwise normal production in 1935. In the meantime, testing was done on how to improve the old 1895 wheel gun since they were stuck with it. On the whole, the Nagant was plenty reliable and its accuracy was still excellent. The cartridge was acceptable. But two complaints kept coming back that awful double action trigger pull, and the lack of rapid loading or unloading. Problems known the day the thing was adopted. Sadly, changing the Nagant was too expensive and complicated to be worth taking on instead of just using an automatic pistol. You could expand that production better than trying to refine all of these. The only real change that was made? The front sight reverted to the original stepped style. Basically, they undid the one change that Tula had made. I've heard this was implemented back in 1932. Less visible, the ramrod was now made in two pieces, then fitted together. This saved on the cost of construction of an individual pistol. Uh, I doubt you would even be able to see it. 
As Togra pistol production improved, the Nagant was ordered in smaller numbers, up until it became obvious that uh, once more the world was going to head into conflict. At the start of the Second World War, the demand was still relatively limited, as Russia was allied with Germany and just took the opportunity to seize part of Poland. They also warred with Finland in the Winter War, which saw further lands ceded. And of course, they took over the Baltic states. The Finnish defense had actually been unexpectedly competent, leading to a great number of losses, both of life and equipment. Finland, of course, made use of what they had captured, as well as what they had inherited from the fall of the Tsarist government just after the Great War. That's why you might find some Nagants marked with their SA brand near the knuckle. Though they were apparently quite unpopular, and their use was avoided as much as possible. Over the course of 1940, the Baltic states were also absorbed, but with a lot less effort. I will say, once at a semi-war, some problems did come to light. Tolerances for production were fairly wide, so certain parts, like the hand, were fitted per revolver. This meant that swapping in a replacement cylinder wasn't a guarantee without making other changes. Still, this is how it has always been. So for the most part, the situation seemed stable enough, up until Germany launched a surprise-ish invasion, well, one that surprised Stalin at least, uh, of the Soviet Union in 1941. This became an all-out war known as the Great Patriotic War in Russia. The swift and effective German attack slowly became bogged down, turning into a vicious war of attrition, though more mobile than the prior Great War. At the time, the Soviets had mobilized about 5.8 5 million men, but had a reserve force of some 14 million. While not all of them would need a handgun, there was no way that the Tokarev alone could meet the demand, so once again, Nagant production was ramped up, at least for a little while. 118,453 reviews from January to October of 1941, which is when production halted due to the evacuation of the Tula Arms factory. It was just too close to the front lines, and so the Nagant revolver production line was moved to Ishev's factory, where it actually became two lines. Production began again in 1942, and despite efforts to speed it up, they only managed to create a little over 15,000 units for the whole year. That's because being a revolver, the Nagant needed precise timing between many rotating components. Mistakes could easily stack up on one another, so experience was king. Now initially, Ishev made Nagants kept that same Tula star marking. However, small parts are generally marked with a triangle and arrow. It wouldn't be until the middle of 1943 that Ishev's own marking was applied, the arrow in a triangle in a circle. In early 1942, it was decided to resume production back at the previously evacuated Tula plant, though technically it was a new factory created in January of 1942 new men, new equipment. It initially focused on the production of Mosin Nagant 1891-30 rifles. Later that year, production was slowly begun again on Nagant revolvers. Once more, the troubles with gauging and properly fitting and timing a wheel gun slowed things down. By January of 1943, only 90 had been produced. Frames were initially provided by Chevs, but they had a rejection rate of over 100%, meaning that all had to be reworked, and some reworked twice. Quality suffered, and for some months during uh, live proof testing, the rejection rate soared to over 200 or even 300 percent. Workers even tried resubmitting uncorrected revolvers, hoping that they would sneak through the inspectors. It was so bad that in September, the average number of cartridges spent per revolver in all the adjustments testing was 33 and a half. That's more shots than any of these things were going to fire in combat. Things only got worse from there. By example, the failure rate for frames, now made again in Tula, was over 700% in December. They still were making revolvers, but like I said before, if you see an arrow in a star marked 1943, that's not made in Tula anymore. So what mark did they use? Well, it became this, a sort of hammer in a star. That's the new emblem going forward. Similar but distinct, and given the poor and low production numbers, much more uncommon to find. Production was better in 1944, though not what you'd call good. Returns were still common enough that some factory workers had a great idea. They duplicated the inspector's die and went ahead and approved some of the rejects. Problem solved, until the higher-ups found out about it, and then they were in trouble. In May of 1945, revolver production was halted at Chev's. July would be Tula's last month. The war was finally under control, and the revolver was no longer a priority. The 1895 Nagant had finally stopped being manufactured. 
Some records are spotty, but total production of the 1895 likely exceeded 2,600,000 pieces. An amazing feat for a revolver that was, again, obsolete before it was ever adopted. Now, when it came to actual combat, just how badly did the Nagant perform? Well, let's start with the positives. Yes, it was rugged and accurate. Yes, the cartridge was lethal, if not ideal. And in specific cases, it even outperformed the Tokarev. First, its little barrel could fit through the firing ports of tanks or other armored vehicles. It also didn't dump brass everywhere inside those enclosed spaces. Second, it was specifically noted as not failing during the harsh, freezing winters. Whereas there were limited reports of Tokarevs jamming up thanks to their grease hardening up and slowing down the slide on firing. That's about all the good points. Once again, the double action trigger was awful, all because of that gas seal mechanism, which yes, yeah, sped up the ammo, but not enough to offset that light low caliber bullet. Lethality was still too low to warrant such god awful tension. Loading was painfully slow, frankly never acceptable from the start. Moreover, by World War II, we saw significant manufacturing problems sneaking in. Improperly heat-treated hammers and cylinders, rough chambers that made for stuck casings, and weak springs. Yes, it was better than a stick or a rock, but the whole reason that it made it to over 2 million units is because of institutional momentum. The tooling was paid for by the last guy, and the ammo was already in inventory. It wasn't so much loved as it was expensive to replace. And yet, it still soldiered on. Post-war, both the Nagant and the Tokarev were actually assessed as far from ideal. The next handgun would need to be lighter, more compact, and still semi-automatic. The only reason noted to keep the revolver in army use was for service with tank crews, just like you'd expect. Even so, it's hard to ignore so much inventory on hand. The Nagant was kept in limited use until displaced in the army and navy. It still kept service in various police and other armed government forces for decades to come. We see it in places like the Forest Services, Fisheries Inspection, and even Geological Expeditions. Sometime during the 1960s, or perhaps into the 1970s, many Nagants were re-arsenaled, overhauled for repair and refinishing. The great majority of them, at that time, had their grips replaced with plastic panels. At that same time, any remaining single actions were converted to triple action. Any remaining half-moon sights were upgraded to the current standard, the Old Step. This configuration is the one we most commonly see in the US today, as many were sold surplus in the 2000s. Now this episode is already quite a long one, so I don't want to go into too much detail on the handful of non-standard Nagant 1895 revolvers, but there are a few that kind of stand out. The most commonly encountered is the shortened Nagant. Both the barrel and the grip have been reduced in length. These first appeared before the Great War, likely as a product of the Russo-Japanese War. Recall, due to limited orders, the factory was allowed to sell direct to various state entities like the police. Well, that's where the first reduced size Nagants tend to appear. Production seems to have vanished with the Great War, but re-emerged in 1924, lasting until 1932. Overall, it's estimated some 25,000 were made. These would have been issued wherever they were more convenient or with enforcement officers who needed a concealed carry. While they might have been used by the NKVD, they were not exclusive to them. Fun fact, there was actually military testing of the short barrel Nagant pattern to see if it could replace the regular length in service. While it was found to be fine at 25 meters, at 50 it suffered enough to be abandoned. Accessories wise, the Nagant has also been fitted at various times with silencers. Thanks to the gas seal cylinder, it's one of the few wheel guns that can be suppressed. The methods vary and frankly warrant their own research and further explanation some other day. Around 1912, a limited number of long barrel fixed stock Nagants were manufactured for testing with the mounted border guards. The idea being to replace both the carbine and the revolver in service with something effective up to 100 meters. The ammunition, however, wasn't really up to the task, so the project was ultimately abandoned. I should also point out that various target model Nagants have been made over the years for sport shooting. These can be fairly standard or sub-caliber, and may even have custom grips. For instruction, two types of Nagant 1895 were made in addition to the standard. The first was a cutaway, which allowed for teaching how the mechanism works. The second, more common example, was a training model. These are often marked like this, and generally do not feature proof-firing marks, as they were often made of rejected parts because they weren't actually meant to be 
fired with live ammunition. Instead, these were issued out to be used in the instruction of how to care for the revolver, that way any mistakes were made with a less important example. Now, I think that has us covered for the Nagant itself, but before we wrap, we should check on old Leon. He wouldn't make it long without his brother by his side, passing away in 1900. The firm was turned over to his sons, who frankly had more interest in automobiles than in arms. Unfortunately, you might have noticed, no one seems to drive a Nagant these days, or has in some time. Leaving the arms market may or may not have been a good idea. I suspect it was a necessary step as no one else in the family had MLA's talent in that regard. All right, with all of this finally covered, I think we should take some time to get May's opinion on the Nagant revolvers, both single and double. All right, once more, we've made room for May. Hey. And we have a pair of Nagant revolvers. We do. Both model 1895 Russian. Mm-hmm. One in single action and one in triple action, being both a single and a double. Yeah, from the outside, you really kind of can't tell. No, you pretty much have to cock the hammer and, and look at the hammer to figure it out. Okay. Which I imagine was somewhat annoying in service, too. If you're yeah, if you're going to pick one up and it's like, ah. Yeah, oh, I don't know why we didn't even think about that this far in the episode. All right, so which would you like to start with, single or triple? Let's start with single first. All right, I believe. Let's double check. Yep, that's that guy. So. Okay. There is your single action only Nagant revolver as originally envisioned by the Russian commission. Neat. How does it feel? Well, it feels um, very small. Uh, I guess I was expecting it to be slightly larger than it was, but the grip, my hand just barely fits on that. So anyone right. with larger hands is not going to really have a good time, but it's very compact. It's a small bore revolver, which kind of fits in with a lot of the European countries at the time, what they were doing. Yes. Yeah, so the Nagant is a very interesting intersection of things. Yeah. Um, the Nagant 1878 that we saw out of Belgium was a 9.4 millimeter black powder revolver that you liked quite a bit. Yes, I did. Uh, and then along with the 86. The Ergonomically, it was a very comfortable shooter. Right. The 86 actually is the one that has lock work more similar to this. Mm -hmm. The whole thing gets scaled down into the Swedish and Norwegian styles like this guy here. Right. The reason they're scaled down is because those countries are pursuing what essentially is the Swiss evolution of small arms technology small bore smokeless projectiles. Interestingly for the Swiss, despite going small bore on their 1882 revolver, yep. they didn't really bump up the speed all that much, which would have been what you'd expect. You'd expect a really screaming hot little, like, you know, yeah. 7.5 millimeter. No, it ended up just being kind of weak and not very useful for war. Right. But what they were trying to do is have the same bore as their rifle, which the French also did. They wanted to have the same bore as their rifle and reused rifle barrels. So the French did an 8mm revolver, smokeless. Okay. Makes sense. And then you get an 8mm revolver in Austria-Hungary, mm -hmm. smokeless. Although that was after this particular gun. Yeah, eight shots. But it's all sort of this one family of very compact, small bore smokeless revolvers based on the Swiss 1882's core concept. Okay. That in, tracks them. This fits in that pattern. Right. A lot of them, the Rostengasser, the Swiss, the 1892. French. They're all based off of Fonu lockworks, mm -hmm. which we've talked about in the show before. Right. The Nagant is not actually a Fonu lockwork, so it's actually sort of the, the odd duck out. Mm -hmm. And then it gets even weirder because the Russians are the first ones to go, yeah, 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 this is cool and all, but why is it so slow? It can't be small and slow. Mm -hmm. So they want to go fast, so it gets a gas seal. Okay. And then what you're feeling is, disregarding the gas seal for a moment, is the mm -hmm. fact that for some reason they shortened up the script. Yeah. They made it even smaller than this already very compact and handy revolver. Not for me. Very comfortable. I'm actually able to get a good solid grip on there. I'm right there with the knuckle. I'm right there with the trigger. That's actually, it's a very solid grip. Do you prefer it to this? The Norwegian? Oh, no, the Norwegian feels way better. Does it? <laughs> the The angle of the grip, the actual taper to it just feels slightly better. They did. They changed the angle. And it, it's, it's a little, it's a little bit thinner as well. Something about that combo. This just, God, that's a natural grasp. Yeah, it yeah, really yeah. is by comparison. You know, they said that they changed the angle for better shooting. They said they shortened it up, which... I don't know that they shortened it up for better shooting. That might have been more for when it's holstered, not banging into stuff. Yeah. Um, I don't, there's not a lot of detail in the justification for that change. Mm -hmm. I agree with you, especially with my larger hand. I prefer the Norwegian and Swedish patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure what they were up to. Not sure either. So, anyway. Um. Okay, so obviously we have a, a Russian Nagant here. It's very iconic. Everyone can pretty much recognize it just for the looks alone. Uh, we are a... Gate loading and ejecting revolver. This one's single action only. We have a 
giant half moon front with a V notch rear that obviously is still visible with the hammer forward. So they really want to just at least give you sights at every moment. Well, it's because they don't want to change any parts. There's no reason to have the sight necessarily visible with the hammer forward mm -hmm. on a single action only, except for the part where we only want to change the minimal number of parts to be able to make it triple action any time. Okay, so that so makes sense. So then we just go ahead and build it like it's going to be. How, how interchangeable are the parts between this and the triple action? It's pretty much the locking block and then the hammer, which then has the hammer nose on it. Okay. Those are the big parts that you have to just swap out. The only other problem is the way production went, you pretty much have to hand fit. That's the part nobody really mentioned. So. Mm. I guess maybe I should go into the order. I should do more along the order of how we actually utilize this piece. So, okay, loading. Yeah, loading first. All right, I swung open the gate. It's a biased position once the gate reaches a certain point. It kind of wants to fall over. Right. Okay, not bad. You got seven detents for the severed chambers. Yep, and then it's really nice, those detents, they really kind of just lock into place for this. This feels really good and positive. So there's, right. I feel like this is something leaning towards when we talked about before in this series, if you're able to load something and in poor lighting, that's right. a really good plus. They also have adopted a very old standard that we've talked about before, which was an improvement to the Adams revolvers, which actually we're hoping to discuss sometime soon, mm -hmm. which is that um, we saw this with Colt's agent in Britain, uh, not Samuel Colt, but the Colt, the company. Um, okay. Their agent in Britain said, hey, if you're gonna make a double action, make sure that when you roll the cylinder, you can roll it back a little bit. Yes. And when it, when it rolls back, it should stop aligned for the next cartridge to be shoved in. Mm -hmm. So that way in the dark, you can sort of go click, clunk, load, click, clunk, load, yeah. click, clunk, Or even load. if you just don't wanna look at it right. for whatever reason. And that's what those detents are doing. They index and they favor click. Mm -hmm. And if you try to roll it back, they won't roll back right. so that you can just go ahead and set your cartridge. That's pretty smart. Yeah. It makes it a little more, uh, Simple soldier friendly. Right. Yes. Okay, so I've got her loaded up. But you don't have an Abity. No, I don't have an Abity. No other loading system. And by the way, we compared this before to the Swiss 82, Abity, the uh, Rostin Gosser, Abity, and then the French 1892, swing out cylinder. Right. So mm, there's no loading assist. Right. So it is going to be slow going, unfortunately. Right. There is that. Um, and then this one being single action only, the only thing I really have to do is work the hammer and then pull the trigger. Very heavy hammer pull. Yeah. And very clunky. Very negative of it. How about that? Well, it's almost like you're overriding a mainspring and then also shoving on a, uh, a coil spring set inside the cylinder. And also shoving the cylinder forward. Right, against that spring. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's definitely going to. Well, if it's a positive gas seal, at least there's that, I guess. Are you ready? Yeah. Set. Cough. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Oh, it is slow going. And even on range, I was still, I was making sure, oh God, make sure you get all the nice clunk sounds in there too. Don't go too fast. It looks like the scale of the revolver makes it easy enough for you. It's just that spring tension. Yeah, I can reach up and the knuckle's not so stuck out in such a way that I can't have to reach around it awkwardly. It's mm -hmm. actually a pretty easy reach with it. I'm not having to pull it, attempt to pull it over center or like something like the infields. It's actually at a good angle for me. And there's a nice hook up here on the hammer itself for me to reach my thumb around. How much do you think that gas seal's really adding? Let's go with a non-gas seal Nagant of similar construction. Oh. God, that's way nicer. Yeah. It's just smoother too. Yeah. It's just so clean by comparison. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then the trigger pull itself, like it really was just a single action trigger. There's not much to it there. Yeah. It's a little bit of weight, weight, but barely. I give it credit. The single action pull between the gas seal and the non-gas seal, fairly comparable. That's fair. And then recoil, Nothing. It's like it was very, very mild. I don't think it's nothing, but it is very mild. Yeah. Yeah. It's not nothing, nothing, but it's it's a it's a mild recoil to this. It's actual. very controllable. If it weren't for the fact that it's so hard to rearm, it would actually be a very fast shooter. Right. I could see the argument. You know, seven rounds mm -hmm. instead of six. Yeah, it's not the best cartridge, but you can get those shots off, and it's very low recoil. Well, yeah, that sounds great. But it's single action only. Oh, okay. Well, right. there went that. <laughs> and that's if you can get in a triple action or a double action pull rather. Uh, not so great either. So this gun's the same. Uh-huh. Except for the fact that you can have double action as one of your options. Yes. So why don't we go ahead and let you also tell us about that before we go too deep into it, which is same load, same everything else. But mm -hmm. how about that trigger pull? Well, um, it's special because there is some weight to it. Don't get me wrong. However, unlike most triggers, um, you feel every single thing that's happening internally with this guy. Like you can feel when it snags certain parts, when it's pushing certain ways, because the pressure of the trigger also changes with that too. So each new clunk adds a different kind of weight to the piece. It either reduces or adds. There's also like a texture the whole way through, a changing it, texture. Yes. Let's see if we can guess, because 
the Colt Single Action Army. Uh-huh. Everybody talks about it being like a four-click hammer. Right? Okay. How many clicks does it take to get to the shot fired in an Agon? In 1895, there's our initial take-up, which mm-hmm. is almost immediate. Yep. That's my making contact with the nose. Yes. So I start pulling that nose through, and then... The hand comes up and it makes contact with the cylinder and starts cylinder rotation. Which you could feel that I saw you. I saw you. Ex- you pulled a little bit right. uh, further and, in with that. And as I start that cylinder rotation, there's almost an immediate lope because right. I think it has something to do with our seven chambers. And a lot of people don't realize this, but hands don't just point. The, the hand doesn't just hit the notch on the back of the cylinder mm-hmm. and rotate it up and then like push it all the way up right the side wall also presses on that thing mm-hmm. and so i think what we're feeling is this that transition action, yeah yeah is already kind of kicking in and it's got a weird lump in it that's mm-hmm. i think that's what we're getting so there's a jerk over center yep then we get up to this high position and yeah. what's happened is we have our sprag kicking in and our cylinder still hasn't moved forward yet at all right our sprags kicked in and made a click mm-hmm. then our cylinder starts like right here we hit a wall yep and that wall is going to be, I believe, the hand starting to push the cylinder forward uh-huh. with the support of that breech block. Yep. So that starts to come forward. Wait, there's where the breech, there's where that little breech block starts to move a little bit yep. right there. And then I sort of fall into a well for a second. Uh-huh. And then it's actually quite difficult to hold the well. I'm really gripping this thing now. <laughs> and then if I just keep pulling, now it's now got a really... You don't have your seal yet in the back. I'm still seeming some gap there. Yeah, but I've also <laughs> I've got a really rubbery feeling <laughs> under extreme duress that sort of goes... Whoop, you know, uh-huh. and then it goes off. This is a lot of things to have yeah, there's happen. A lot of, there's a lot of moments in that. <laughs> yeah. That is a whole movie. This is the right antithesis there. of the triple lock. Right. <laughs> like just, just every, the, yeah. Every creak and cranny middle and can end feel it. With, with a climax in the middle. All right. Um. <laughs> so it's, it's not boring, but it is not pleasant. Yeah. It's not a movie I would see again. Do you, do you feel like you were able to fire it accurately in double action? No, unfortunately. When the trigger pull is just that lopey, that clunky, that changing, it really does just kind of change up. It's just not, it's not easy for you to pull through like carefully and mm-hmm. slowly. You actually have to pull through with some gusto to ensure that you're, you're getting a solid grip on it, I guess. Right. It's not comfortable. As a matter of fact, for this episode, May had to go and retrain her finger just to use this gun properly. Well, yeah, that was a whole Because different... in our demonstration just now, we left out one more lobe because mm-hmm. there's one thing missing. There was not live ammunition in this firearm. Yep. And that actually counts because when the breech block comes into play, mm-hmm. it makes contact with the back of the casing and then shoves on it as well. Mm-hmm. And there's a certain... And you'll see it. The, the back of the cartridge is is tapered, right? Yes. Because the breech block comes in a slight angle, mm-hmm. and it has to kind of heal up and press. And on the available ammunition to us, it wasn't a perfect fit. It would drag and snag a little bit. Mm-hmm. And poor May, despite strengthening her fingers with all these other guns, hadn't shot a Nagant 1895 in a long time. Quite some time. And right when that final extra tension hit, it would lock up and take another 12 pounds of pressure. And it just she just couldn't deliver because we had already filmed yeah. like six guns that day, including the Gehendras, I believe. That was unfortunate. But I did have to retrain. Got a wonderful little callus on my trigger <laughs> finger as a result of that. But hey, I was pulling through that trigger on what is one of the worst Nagats we had set aside for that. Right. Over fifty times a day. Right. So that was we, enough to get through this shoot, no problem. <laughs> Which we had to like we had to take a janky Nagant and old ammo so that mm-hmm. you could just train on that weird hand motion. Yes. It's brutal. It is honestly. I hate to say it, I believe it might actually be worse than the Philippine Trigger, not in terms of weight. The Philippine Trigger is the worst in terms of weight. Oh, yeah, hands down. But the Philippine Trigger is a lot smoother than this. Oh, no question. It really is. And they also made it so that you could essentially have the room with it, too. Like, you're able to get a nice, solid, even pull with it, too. You can get two fingers in there if you have to. Right. Which would you you rather bank your life on, actually, in terms of just trying to pull the trigger off in a hurry? Ooh, one question on that front. Can I... Reduce the load on the the hammer spring so that I could I could, can I unscrew that <laughs> screw at the front? Yeah. Uh, no. Let's assume that we're shooting it as issued militarily. Oh, really? Because the seventy eight. I've got a knife on me. I should be able to just twist it a little bit. <laughs> the seventy eight hundred two is brutal. Brutal hand strength required. It was. We I think rated it at twenty six pounds. Yeah, something like that. I don't. It was in the twenties, we'll which episode. was fantastic. Yeah. It was also. Distinctly difficult for you to use and mm-hmm. required you to practice up. Yep. However, it was one pull. It was. It was one pull and you were done. Okay. It was consistent and even. 
you know, it's kind of sad. I never thought I would say it, but I think I might take the O2 over the Nagant. Really? I find it tricky. I've handled Nagants that I would take over the O2 every day. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, I believe that one is actually slightly better than the O2 in my mind. Okay. Because it's an original Zarist made Nagant that has not been refurbished. Despite looking hideous on the outside, this is actually in good shape mechanically. Mm -hmm. A lot of the refurbs were sort of made out of World War II parts that were really not well made to begin with. Right. And then poorly fit together and refurbed later, which technically improved them some, but they were also deeply refinished. Mm -hmm. Those can get downright miserable. These are actually the better examples than the World War II ones in That's a lot of ways. really sad. Yes. Some of you out there bought in on these when they were cheap, and you know they can be a lot. <laughs> So, so sorry. The idea of accurate fire with a double action on this. I just don't see the accuracy there, man. It's it's not a consistent pull at mm. all, ever. Yeah, Even I mean, on the nice versions, it's not a consistent great pull at all. What's your confidence in defending yourself with a Nagani 1895? Uh, not great. If you were a Russian soldier and you mm -hmm. had your Smith & Wesson number three single action taken from you mm -hmm. and they gave you this. I mean, at least I can pull the trigger now. Well, on the Smith & Wesson number three, you, it was a single action that was a lightweight pull. No, no, no. Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I was thinking at least I've trained up on the trigger pull on this one. Oh, I, could, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I completely misread what you're saying. Yeah, you could handle it now. But I'm yeah. talking about, like, how happy would you be to lose I mean, your... I'd, I mean, I'd probably be happier that I've at least gone to a triple action. So... Yeah. There is Barely. that. But then I'd be like, oh, but this is the triple action you gave me? Really? <laughs> <laughs> what if they gave you the single action? I might want to go back to the Smith of Wesson. Oh, if I can. maybe, yeah. maybe a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I think I might mutiny. I mean, I don't know how they did it. I don't know how they took the cavalry and said, "Hey, hey, hey, throw those out. You're getting this." <laughs> yeah. Oh God, I'd be furious. I guess it comes with a lanyard ring. <laughs> the other one came with a lanyard ring. <laughs> no, it had the belt sash. Yeah, I'm yeah, sorry. yeah. The hook for your belt. Oh my God. Okay. So yeah, I don't. I don't Not want, confidence inspiring, these are. The Mosin in this are both, and I don't, I know people get mad for dogging Russian stuff, and there's a lot of things where it says, well, they made a billion of them and well, no, they're actually, serving two I like wars. your point. You were talking about how priority stacks, where they would just be like, okay, no, we definitely want this one thing, and they would fight and fight and fight and get, try to get this one thing that they're focused on for whatever it was. And I was like, okay, then we move on to the next thing. It's right. like, that's not how you build a stable anything. Right. It, it, it's almost the same doctrine as the Mosin. We mm -hmm. want 30 cal. We want it to be accurate. Right. And we want it to be single shot. And then we'll worry about all that other stuff. And it's it's the same thing. Like they just they did the exact same process all again. They're going, look, 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 like the Mosin. They're like, look, we'll worry about the magazine later. Let's just make a bolt action that's accurate and long range and smokeless powder. Okay, but then you end up with this weird magazine that's really over engineered. I'm yep. sorry. You also have a weird bolt, which is frankly just a modified Hotchkiss bolt, but that's a whole other argument. The Nagant is the same thing, though. It's just like, look, we need 30 caliber, and we need to be very accurate at a certain range, mm -hmm. and we need to be at least a certain muzzle velocity. Oh, well, we can do right. that with a gas seal. Oh, okay, good. And then, well, what it ruins the double action. Who cares about double action? That's not. We're not worried about double action until later. Right yeah, now, single we need, actions. Where yeah, it's at. Why are we worried? We got to get. We got to get these numbers in a line first, and then we can worry. Oh, it turns out it was bad. Like uh, it, it just ugh, the stuff they chose to lock in on. It's so strange it's sometimes. very British of them. No, it's not even that, because the British didn't log in that viciously. They would try at least to, to do well, a no, combination think, of features. I guess there's more, I'm thinking more just that in terms of the time that was spent to stay locked into stuff, because the British would do things where they would be like, the wheels of ch change would not move very easily sometimes. Oh, you know what you're thinking of? You're thinking of the Martini Henry, yeah. where they had one or two bolt actions blow up on them, so for 15 years they would never look at another bolt action. Yes, exactly. It's kind of, you are right, it's kind of the same thing. It's like, well, look, the double action on this is terrible. Well, yeah, it was a gas seal revolver. A double action is terrible. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> so, so, Whatever. I just, I love the Nagant. Because I, I'm so surprised it exists. Mm -hmm. But I kind of love the Mosin for that same reason. It's one of those things where like, who made this and why? <laughs> and it should be this scarce, weird thing that we're all scratching our heads about. But it turns out once they started making it, no one for 50 or 60 years came around with enough money to say we should do something else. Yeah, no. Uh, but they were just like, nope, we have the tooling and we have the ammo. It's too expensive to change. Let's just keep going with yeah, this. We're doing this. Ain't nobody got time. You want to be in charge of changing that? 
Yeah. It, I, it you does, pay it. You fix it, then you insti- pay for it. Institutional momentum is kind of amazing, right? Yeah. Because no one gets blamed for just doing the same thing over and over again until you're way, you're at the end of the game a hot potato. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you're the guy that's like out in front of it being like, guys, we could fix this right now. We just have to spend like a quarter of the budget. Uh-huh. Everybody's like, ah, nah, nah, I'm, not, mm, um, I'm not sticking my head up for that guy. No. So I get it. But God, it's just so wild that this exists in large. It's one of those things, uh-huh. again... It is wild this exists in large numbers. I can't mm-hmm. believe it exists in large numbers. It should be some curiosa that no one ever sees or handles. And yet here it, it is. It said there's 2.6 million of them. It is the worst unicorn. <laughs> That's what it is. Next children's <laughs> book right there. The Nagant, the worst unicorn. All right. Well, I guess I do have some things to give out because much of our improved understanding of the evolution of the modern revolver came from the direct research of historical patents, as there is no book currently that has the entire story. Special thanks must go to our various volunteers who have helped me gather these documents from around the world. Most of the organization of thousands of patents has been handled by our Discord member Alpha Golf, so let's give him a hand as well. Patents have been gathered by our friends Lars and Ludovic and ordinance documentation from my buddy Rune. And of course, all of our expenses have been paid from patron support, so we made this publicly available. You can see the results of their hard work and mine at revolvers.cnarsenal.com. All right, any final thoughts on these guys? Happy to have the experience again, the the fresh experience, because it had been quite some time with them. Um, Happy that that's hopefully the last experience. (laughs) I think we got through a lot more detail this time. A little bit more has turned up. It was a good rehash. I'm a little proud of this one. Pretty good. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you haven't gone, you can be proud of it at home. Yes, you can. But because for, we did this episode, you weren't proud before, but now you're proud. <laughs> for our part, we're done with them, so we're yeah. leaving. Goodbye. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Okay, so Bruno got a poker. He did. He uh, drove up to North Carolina and picked up this thing that uh, we, there's a group called Revware, R-E-V-W-A-R-E, mm-hmm. and they do, uh, they have a product that is for very, very fine mechanical, uh, how do I put this? It's an alternative to 3D scanning. Mm-hmm. So everybody gets excited about 3D scanning, right? Mm-hmm. But 3D scanning has certain limitations and a kind of a lot of post-processing and things to do. Mm-hmm. These guys instead have what looks like a mechanical arm with a pen on it. And so Simonov, all he had was this thing he'd been working on for, you know, almost a decade. So he's like, what if we make it bigger? And it worked. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, he just went, went, okay, yeah, I guess that just, hasn't worked out he fine. He scaled it up to, you know, an anti-tank round. And it worked, which is Wild, and one of the reasons it worked is because it was designed to be a very light system as a semi-automatic rifle. Mm-hmm. And so, when they scaled up to an anti-tank rifle that was semi-automatic, you would think a semi-automatic tank rifle at that time would weigh, you know, unbelievable amounts. And don't get me wrong, it's heavy. Or just that, if it was just a scale up, that necess- that how it was designed would necessarily not be able to withstand the increase in the pressure. Yeah, well, you just keep scaling up the right parts. Yes, so. so yeah, but it's, there's there's very little mechanical difference between a PTRS and a SKS. That's kind of cool. Yeah, isn't that fun? I forgot where I was going with this. I'm completely distracted by Hitler now. Uh, <laughs> Yo, dang! <laughs> you know when that happens, Hitler's you're sitting eight. on the John, you're trying to focus on something. Oh crap! You got distracted by Hitler again. You totally forgot to finish your poo. As the hand rises, it catches one of the cylinder's ratchet teeth, rotating the next cartridge into position. Releasing the trigger causes the hand to fall, and it skips down the angled face of the next ratchet tooth. While the hand pushes the cylinder clockwise, this extension off the trigger serves to halt it in the correct alignment. Pulling the trigger causes the stop extension to rise.